Hey everyone, Lainey here, and I wanted to share my special announcement with you. For those of you who've been keeping up with the show, you know that I was expecting my daughter in May of 2021, and I'm happy to report that on May 7th, 2021, she was born, so her name is Tilden, and we have been having such a great time getting to know her and loving on her, and I'm really appreciative of everyone who's reached out and shared their well wishes and congrats with us. We are so in love with this little girl. But I decided to come back really quickly to do an episode because I miss you guys so much. So here's an episode called The Wamsley Murders. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. As we have learned before, children kill their parents for many reasons. To stop abuse, because they're about to be cut off financially, as a result of a psychotic break, and many other reasons. Today's episode looks at another specific reason, greed. It also looks at how corrupt the justice system can be, and might leave you questioning how fair some sentences are. It also looks at how corrupt the justice system can be and might leave you questioning how fair some sentences are. Okay, on to the show. Rick and Susanna, or Susie Wamsley, were a much-loved couple in their Mansfield, Texas neighborhood near the Walnut Creek Country Club. The couple had two children, Sarah and Andrew, as well as a four-year-old granddaughter. They were active in their neighborhood. They were the first to decorate their house for Christmas and held and attended numerous neighborhood get-togethers throughout the year. In 2003, Rick and Susie were hosting two couples on Christmas Eve to exchange gifts. Mansfield is a normally quiet suburb in the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. Rick and Susie were the fifth and sixth murders of 2003, although usually Mansfield averaged one homicide a year up to 2003. In 2002, there had been no homicides in Mansfield. The Wamsleys had lived in their two-story, 2,900-square-foot Walnut Creek home since 1995. The couple had recently purchased a horse, something Susie had desperately wanted. Rick had grown to love the horse, and Susie laughingly told friends, he's a cowboy now. Susie was a tall redhead who was a stay-at-home mom. She and Rick had met when they were attending different schools. Rick went to school at Oklahoma State University, and Susie went to school at Oklahoma Christian College. They married in 1978, and Sarah was born seven months later on Valentine's Day. Andrew was born in 1984. Rick was a CPA who had worked for multiple companies in Salt Lake City, Dallas, and Houston. In 2003, Rick worked from home and did large projects in the yard, such as a flagstone patio and a tiered fountain in the backyard. Susie loved going antiquing and once leased a booth at an antique mall to sell her finds. As her kids got older, however, she stopped and started attending pep rallies to take pictures of Sarah in her cheerleader's uniform. Susie and Andrew frequently went fishing, and she cooked dinners the entire family would eat. If one member didn't like something they were having, she would fix them something entirely different. Susie ordered pizza for the kids' friends and always had brownies on hand. On December 9, 2003, one of their neighbors, Patty Clark, went over to Rick and Susie's to look at Susie's Christmas tree. They discussed their annual Christmas get-together while Rick finished hanging lights on the outside of the house. On December 11th, when the neighbor returned home around 9 o'clock p.m., she noticed the Wamsley's Christmas lights were not on, but she just thought they were out for the evening. She was still up in the early morning hours of December 12th when one of her son's friends came to the house and asked what was going on next door. The house was awash in light but not Christmas lights. Police cars flashed, lighting up the late night sky and alarming the neighbors. The neighbors were able to get out of the officers that the couple had been found inside, dead. Officers needed to get in touch with the children, so they asked Patty, who wasn't sure how to contact them. 
Around 11.40 p.m. on December 11th, an open 911 call was received by Mansfield Police Department's telecommunications operators. No one was on the line or responded, so officers were dispatched. The officers arrived at 11.44 p.m. and found the garage door open. Upon entering the garage, they found the interior door was also open. When they entered the home, they found Susie on the couch with several stab wounds and a gunshot wound to the left side of the head. Rick was also found in the living room, but on the floor, with multiple gunshot wounds and stab wounds. He also had numerous defensive wounds and multiple scratches on his face. The couple's son, Andrew, pulled up to the home after midnight on December 12th, driving his white Ford Mustang. He was accompanied by his girlfriend, Chelsea Richardson. They agreed to accompany police to the police department for questioning and were released a short time later. Andrew initially gave his consent to have the Mustang searched, but withdrew it. Police instead impounded the vehicle. Investigators found there had been large quantities of blood in the car, mostly in the back seat, but some were also found in the front seats. The seats had been thoroughly cleaned, so DNA testing was impossible. The autopsies revealed that Rick was shot multiple times and stabbed 21 times. Susie was shot once in the head, which was a fatal wound, then stabbed 18 times. Rick was wearing only his underwear and was covered in blood. There were also large bloodstains in the living room, showing the areas where he had struggled and fought his attackers. Susie was only partially clothed and covered by a blanket. She was also covered in blood. Two sets of bloody footprints were found in multiple areas of the home. Another incident came to light during the investigation. On November 9th, Rick and Susie were driving north on Interstate 35 with their daughter Sarah, heading to a late lunch at Chili's in Burleson, Texas. Rick was exiting the freeway when the trio heard a loud thud and felt something slam into the car. When they pulled into the parking lot, they examined their Jeep Laredo and found a bullet hole in the left rear panel. A bullet was recovered from the back seat of the SUV. Rick called the Burleson Police Department and filed a report. He said he had seen a white Ford Mustang pass about the same time they felt the bullet's impact. Apparently, Susie called Andrew and asked where he was. The incident was investigated, but with no leads, it quickly became cold. However, after the homicide, the Burleson Police Department contacted the Mansfield Police Department about the highway shooting incident. An early person of interest in the case was Sarah's ex-boyfriend, Todd Cleveland. Sarah and Todd had a brief relationship which resulted in the birth of their daughter. As a teenager, Sarah was sent to a psychiatric inpatient treatment facility because she was rebellious. She was later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In March 1997, right before Sarah was set to graduate from high school, Rick and Susie kicked her out of the house, tired of all of her acting out. Sarah moved in with Todd, who was a college student at Mansfield Community College. They dated only briefly, although their child was born in January 1999. Sarah felt like she could not care for the child, so she signed away her custodial rights, retaining visitation privileges. In 2001, Sarah began the process to regain custodial rights. Todd had obtained his master plumber license and was married. The custody battle soon became contentious. Because of this, Rick and Susie began to become more and more involved, which is why Todd was considered a person of interest in their murders. However, he took a polygraph examination and passed. He was quickly cleared as a person of interest. Andrew and Sarah remained the top persons of interest since they had the most to gain from their parents' deaths. There was almost $100,000 in cash to be divided and a $1 million insurance payoff. Investigators asked both children to take polygraph examinations. Sarah passed and Andrew did not. He stopped cooperating with investigators at that point. Andrew was also volatile. Once, while at a restaurant celebrating his father's birthday, Andrew threw a bowl of cheese dip across the room when Rick refused to order another one. Another time Andrew was at home, 
watching an overdue movie rental. Rick demanded Andrew give him the movie, but Andrew refused to stop watching it. Rick promised to re-rent it, but a furious Andrew threw it at his dad, hitting him hard enough in the head to draw blood. Andrew worked as a shift manager at a local putt-putt golf. Coworkers said he was a jerk and no one wanted to work on his shift. When Andrew had conflicts, he quit his job rather than be fired. Andrew met Chelsea Richardson in late 2002 at an IHOP restaurant located behind the parks at Arlington Mall. Andrew went there to play Yu-Gi-Oh! and Chelsea went with her brother. She didn't like playing Yu-Gi-Oh! but she enjoyed talking to Andrew. Her brother worked as a security guard and the two siblings lived with their mother Celia, who struggled to make ends meet. Their father had passed away in 1999 while in his 40s. Chelsea was also close to Ruth Brustrom, who had been a friend of the family since Chelsea was nine. Ruth's husband, who had been like a father figure to Chelsea and her brother, had passed away in 2002. Andrew was seemingly more at home at Ruth's double-wide mobile home than he was at his own large home in Mansfield. Ruth lived in the country with several barn-red outbuildings and a pond. Ruth liked Andrew and said he was, quote, The best guy Chelsea had brought out here. He seemed real honest. Although Rick and Susie had met Chelsea before, they were not aware there was anything more serious than a friendship. They thought Andrew and Chelsea were friends and also considered Chelsea poor white trash. However, by fall 2003, Andrew had dropped out of college and his parents had cut him off financially. He spent all of his time with Chelsea living at the Richardson house, which one investigator said was filthy. The couple spent a lot of time at IHOP playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Soon after Andrew moved in, one of Chelsea's friends, Susan Toledano, had moved in following a fight with her mother. Susan was trying to finish high school while working at a fast food restaurant. Susan and Chelsea had been friends for several years and had even taken out a full page in their yearbook. The page had photos of them, along with poems and drawings. The three befriended Hilario Cardenas, the night manager at the IHOP they frequented. Hilario, at 24 years old, was a little older than the other three. He was married and had a four-year-old daughter. In January 2004, investigators obtained subpoenas for eight people to submit DNA. Four of these individuals were Andrew, Sarah, Chelsea, and Susan. Susan was only included because she had dyed hair, and investigators had found several strands of hair in Rick's grasp. In February 2004, a Tarrant County grand jury was convened. Susan testified that she had been to the Wamsley's home only once before, nearly a year before, and had never been inside. In March 2004, Sarah filed papers in probate court to prevent Andrew from profiting from their parents' deaths. She believed Andrew had something to do with the murders. A police statement was included with the probate petition. The letter said, quote, Considerable reasonable suspicion surrounds Andrew Wamsley, a suspect in this case, and as such, he should not be considered for any type of benefit from the deaths of Rick and Suzanne Wamsley. On March 30th, 2004, investigators were advised they had a match in the DNA they were able to extract two DNA profiles from evidence collected at the house. One of these profiles belonged to Rick Wamsley. The other profile was Susan Toledano's. Investigators quickly obtained an arrest warrant for Susan, who was staying in Illinois with relatives. She was arrested on April 5, 2004 at her relative's home. After interviewing her, police arrested Eladio Cardenas on April 6, Andrew and Chelsea were both arrested the next day while they were together. Susan and Hilario were charged with capital murder, whereas Andrew and Chelsea were charged with conspiracy to commit murder. As the investigation unfolded, police received more answers to their questions regarding planning and who actually committed the act. The grand jury reconvened in July 2004, where the four suspects were all indicted. Andrew, Chelsea, and Susan were all indicted on capital murder charges. Eladio's charge was downgraded from capital murder to conspiracy to commit murder. Eladio said in October 2003, around Halloween, 
Andrew had started talking about killing his parents and asked him to get him a gun. Eladio purchased a gun on the street for $200 and gave it to the teen, who was supposed to pay him for the gun. Testimony from investigators revealed that multiple fingerprints and bloody palm prints were found throughout the Wamsley home. These prints did not belong to Rick or Susie. On Friday, January 7, 2005, Susan took a plea bargain. She pleaded guilty to murder in exchange for the removal of the death penalty. She was later sentenced to life in prison. Eladio entered an open plea of guilty to the charge, and the trial court sentenced him to 50 years. An open plea is when a defendant pleads guilty without any promise of a reduced sentence. They do so, hoping that their sentence will be better than the prosecution's proposal. Andrew and Chelsea both refused to sign a plea bargain, deciding instead to go to trial. In May 2005, Chelsea Richardson went on trial. The state star witness was Susan. On the first day of testimony, she related the details of the night of the murder. Susan said that the trio had tried on at least three other occasions to kill Andrew's parents and also planned on killing his sister. The first attempt they made was by filling balloons with Drano and placing them in the family car. The second attempt was a drive-by highway shooting. When these attempts failed to work, Andrew had Susan come to the family home one night in November with the plan for her to shoot his parents. Susan backed out that night. On the night the murders were committed, the four of them drove to Andrew's parents' home. They entered the home quietly and saw Susie lying on the couch asleep. Chelsea told Susan to shoot Susie and Susan complied, shooting her once in the head. She then ran to the bedroom and began firing at Rick, who had been awakened by the gunshot. She shot him several times, but he charged her and Andrew had to pull him off. Rick looked at his son and asked him, why? To which Chelsea replied, because I'm pregnant. Rick told them he would do anything he could to help, but Chelsea and Andrew killed Rick while they had Susan stab Susie to ensure she was dead. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? Trust me, I have been there and I still struggle with these issues. But BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you like it's been there for me. You can connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment, which is so convenient for me, and it really makes me feel comfortable. You can now get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you need to. They have licensed professional counselors who are specialized in LGBTQ plus matters, grief, self-esteem, trauma, relationships, anxiety, you name it. Anything you share with them is confidential. And if you're not happy with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time at no additional charge. They have over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states, and they're available worldwide. Start communicating in under 24 hours. The best thing is it's secure, convenient, professional, affordable, and it's not a crisis line. Best of all, like I said, it's a truly affordable option. True Crime Fan Club podcast listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code TCFC. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash TCFC. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash TCFC to get 10% off your first month. Susan testified again at Andrew's trial in 2006. She said he coached her on her role right before the murders occurred. According to Susan, he told her to take her time, and although he said not to rush it, the sooner she finished, the faster they could all go home. She also said that after the first failed shooting attempt, Chelsea and Andrew stopped talking to her for a while. They then told her since she had messed up the first attempt, she had to make it right. 
On December 11th, she received a message that it was time for the killings. Jeremy Lavender testified against Chelsea, saying he had lied to the police when they asked where Chelsea, Andrew, and Susan were on the night of the murders. He said Chelsea had asked him to lie for them and had also asked him for a gun, saying she had something to take care of. Jeremy and Chelsea had dated prior to her relationship with Andrew. Chelsea's defense attorney suggested Jeremy only recanted his original statement because he was scared of the prosecutors. Two inmates who were in jail with Chelsea as she awaited trial testified that she had bragged of the killings. One inmate said Chelsea initially denied her involvement in the crimes, then changed the story to state she was in the house when it occurred. She finally told this inmate that she saw Rick had Susan by her hair, so Chelsea picked up the gun and shot Rick in the shoulder. However, the medical examiner testified that Rick had two gunshot wounds, one in the head, which Susan afflicted, then a fatal wound in the back. The other inmate said Chelsea saw Rick and Susan fighting, and Susan allegedly said, If you don't help me, your whole family is going down. Chelsea told the inmate she stabbed Rick, and when that didn't work, she shot him. The defense for Chelsea presented a letter that was allegedly written by Susan Toledano to Chelsea's mother. The letter stated the murders were a robbery gone bad, and a handwriting expert testified it was Susan's handwriting. Prosecutors denounced the letter and the handwriting expert, pointing out that handwriting analysis is not a science and is based on opinion. The jury took two hours to find Chelsea guilty. On Wednesday, May 25, 2005, Chelsea Richardson became the first woman from Tarrant County to receive a death sentence. At the time, There were nine women awaiting execution in Texas, and currently, there are only six women on death row in Texas. During the penalty phase of the trial, Sarah Walmsley testified as to how she moved four times in the year following her parents' murders. She also had to call her paternal grandparents and let them know about the murders. She was unable to finish, so a police detective had to take the phone and finish delivering the news. At the time of Chelsea's trial, Sarah had two wrapped Christmas presents in her closet. They had been under the tree at the time of the murders. One of them was from Suzanne to Rick. The other one was from Mom and Dad to Sarah. When the sentence was read, Chelsea collapsed into her chair, sobbing. Andrew's trial began on February 27, 2006. After a trial that lasted five days, Andrew Walmsley was found guilty of capital murder. During the penalty phase, some of Andrew's friends testified that he was the kind of person you weren't worried about your child being with. However, prosecutors outlined a plot concocted by Andrew Walmsley while in jail, where he offered a fellow inmate $250,000 to kill his sister Sarah. The inmate, William Wesley Bates, testified he had turned down the quarter-million-dollar payout, saying, I'm a flim-flammer, short-changer, and a thief, but I'll never take anyone's life for no amount of money. Andrew had also tried to convince Wesley Bates to slip nitroglycerin into Susan Toledano's food. Defense attorneys questioned two mental health professionals, who said they had both diagnosed Andrew with schizoid personality disorder, but prosecutors continued to parry with the observation that Andrew had tried to take out two separate hits on people while in jail. Ten of the twelve jurors in Andrew's case did not believe Andrew posed any future threats to society, so Andrew was given life in prison. His sister Sarah ran out of the courtroom crying because she still lives in fear of what Andrew might do from jail. In 2007, Chelsea Richardson's case was appealed. She had a new attorney who filed a writ for a new trial. He claimed prosecutorial misconduct, an effective counsel, and a biased judge. Her new attorney found out that an attorney was representing both Andrew and Chelsea, and therefore providing the prosecutor with information about both. It was also alleged that the prosecutor did not release the psychological examination results of Susan Toledano to the defense attorney. Chelsea's new attorney, Bob Ford, 
alleged that the judge refused a subpoena but did so while Bob was on vacation. Bob argued that the subpoena should have been squashed with all parties present. In September 2007, Chelsea was allowed to give an interview with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. She agreed to the interview but did not want to discuss her case, aside from maintaining her innocence. On death row, she was allowed two hours of work and two hours of recreation time, but the rest of the day was spent inside her small cell. She was not allowed to tape pictures of family or artwork on the walls. Chelsea worked on needlepoint during her two hours of work, which was conducted under the very watchful eyes of the guards. Chelsea's family visited her when they could and believed in her innocence. In November 2011, Chelsea's sentence was overturned and reduced to life in prison. She and Andrew Wamsley are both eligible for parole in 2044. Eladio is eligible for parole in 2024, and Susan in 2034. Rick and Susie's absence was keenly felt in the months after their murders. Their home was no longer decorated with Susie's touch for all the major holidays. Susie was known to provide party favors and individual gifts for her friends at holiday parties. Rick had been a high school football player and a joker. Almost every Friday, Susie and Sarah had lunch together. Andrew played sports growing up and liked paintball. Andrew and Susie would go fishing together, and she often made elaborate cookies for Andrew's class parties. Their friends and neighbors considered moving, but did not want to give up the irises Susie had given them, or the trees Rick had given them. The irony in the murders was that by going to prison, Andrew relinquished all of his inheritance, and Sarah ended up inheriting the entire estate. Okay, fan club members. As I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review and rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com slash TCFCPodcast, Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod, And of course, our website is truecrimefanclub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched and written by Susie St. John, content editing by Brittany Martinez, produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check them out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkofDreams.com. 